Check this out. Is that gorgeous? I am so excited. I am just so excited. I'm going to show you again. Is that fabulous? I'm very excited. Give me one second. We're not really, uh, I have two minutes before it's 10 o'clock. I'm just going to um, activate the other screen. And then I have stuff to talk about. Awesome stuff. Ah, there we go. There I am. There we are. Hang on. Click. 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 All right. Perfect. Hang on. Why is that? Here we go. All right. All righty then, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, I have one, one last interview to do. And, uh, and then I have all my interviews. I have all my first round interviews for... Good morning, sir. I'm late. Please don't send me to detention. <laughs> now, Charles. Good morning, Garen. Hola. So, this, this I've been working. I've been working hard. What do you think? Cool? I'm very excited. It's not the final, it's not the final, but it's where I want to go. It's where I want to go, and it's, it's what I want us to um, be able to think about and, and have something to, um, to, to focus on. So that's the cover of book one. That's the cover of book one, I hope. It's front cover. It's, it's, uh, it's really, I think, taking us where we want to go. The other thing um, is pretty exciting. I, uh, <laughs> I got wristbands in the mail. I got wristbands. So, so um, these teeny weenies, these teeny weenies, I want to make sure I do this the right way. Okay, these little teeny weenies are Care Bear wristbands. And um, I picked them because, <laughs> well, it's my anniversary, for starters. It's my anniversary, so I'm allowed to pick, right? So um, these three colors, uh, where are we here? Okay, these three colors are uh, the colors of my original three Care Bears. So um, this sort of orangey peachy one is uh, is the color of friend bear, and friend bear was uh, uh, the way I created um, friend bear was sort of a clumsy superhero. He had great intentions and he thought he was very big and very strong, but he was also very clumsy. And when I when I did that, uh, <laughs> we're we're sort of in the studio and and it's. So idea the you know the creators give you their idea but then it's you you're the one who says well what if we do this and how about if I do that really hard <laughs> in the control room they're all laughing and I'm going what do you think and they said yes of course let's let's see let's let's take it and see see what we can do with it so friend bear became clumsy and then um, Wish Bear is a, is, is a, so Friend Bear is a little boy. Friend Bear is a, is a little boy. He's a, he's a little boy. <laughs> and then Wish Bear ha is a, is soft, soft blue and with a shooting star. And, and Wish Bear, I wish on all kinds of stuff. Wish Bear is a girl. And then Love a Lot Bear. And we have a very funny story about Love a Lot Bear, but I don't think I can tell in polite company. <laughs> Because the animators, <laughs> where we were working, the guys designing. Uh, anyway, this this lovely soft pink, lovely soft pink, is lovely out there. So you see, when we put them all on, so they're facing the right way. They have to be facing the right way, right? Yeah. Okay. So hang on, hang on. There we go. So when I wear them, see, I put them on, stick them on my wrist. 
and now I am promoting my Care Bears. Is that gorgeous? So I'm going to have Care Bear anniversary, or first anniversary wristbands at Cape. And then you can't do that on television. <clears throat> I may not be able to do it on television anymore, but I can do it on a wristband. I can do it on a wristband. So I have my Care Bears and I have my You Can't Do That on Television band and I have my fabulous Pivot Master Pivotry in Motion wristband. And now I am the wristband diva. How awesome is that? So when people come to Cape, we're going to band together. See what I did there? We're going to band together and celebrate my anniversary. It's my anniversary. It's, it's my anniversary um, as mom. I'm a little bouncy today, right? I'm a little bouncy. That's okay. It's my anniversary. I'm allowed to bounce. Now, why this is cool and important and magical, and I'm sorry, but there's a weird thing with my hair and it's making me crazy. There we go. Um, why this is magical and cool, and what I'm talking about today, is this incredible thing that happens when you open yourself up to the possibility that there are people out there, people you've never met, who will wander into your life, wander their, their path trajectory. Good morning, Melissa. <laughs> Charles, you want the, you want the yuck of a wristband? Yes. <laughs> Maddie Adney. Good morning, Maddie. How wonderful to see you. you I, I haven't seen you um, saying hello before and I'm so excited. This is amazing. Good morning, Steve. All right, the gang is the gang is gathering. All right, so here's what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about when we when we get ourselves in the right frame of mind. When we stop walking around with our tie caught in our zipper and we are open to the idea that that really something amazing is possible. You know what happens? Amazing things. Amazing things happen. Amazing people walk into your life. We're, we're wandering along on parallel paths like all kinds of bunches of rain, railroad tracks and all of a sudden we're, there's a crossing. And there we are, connected. And we can say, Bum, oh sorry, excuse me, and keep going. Or we can say, oh yeah, hey, how you doing? Love your hat. And the next thing you know, you're friends. The next thing you know, you have stuff in common. The next thing you know, you're talking. You're, you're connecting. You're discovering the things you have in common. You're discovering all the things that matter. And some of them we share. And when we share things that matter, there's this incredible possibility that we may be able to leverage each other and get where we want to go. It's possible. All we have to do is ask ourselves, what if? It's all we have to be willing to do. For the latecomers, this. Pivotry in motion. There's magic. I'm going to talk about it in the book. And the other books, so there's now there's a there's a series of six. I know, they're just like bunny rabbits. Hopping all over the place. Hopping into view. So this is the this is the the, the basic book. This is the book uh, cover for the first book. And and what I'm going to do with the first book, Pivotry in Motion, is explain it is describe the rules that I live by. The rules that people 
like us live by. People like us who are willing to wonder what's on the far side of the horizon. I firmly believe because I have lived through a life with people who took their lives, that curiosity is what saves us from despair, from giving up, from deep forever sadness. When we can bring ourselves to a place where we ask, what if? We've stopped standing and staring at the spot where we are. And we've started looking up and forward and ahead. And the minute we do that, anything is possible. I've proved it. And every single person I meet As I profile them, as I listen to what they're saying to me, as I look at the steps they've taken and the assumptions they make, I can tell whether they've stopped asking or they've started. And when they start asking what if, everything changes about them. Everything changes about our conversation together everything changes about what is possible because they're curious. Curiosity is incredible. It's our superpower. Pivotry in motion. It's a crazy kind of phrase. And for the people who have just climbed into the boat with me, uh, I, <laughs> I, it, it popped into my head um, when I wasn't looking. When I wasn't thinking about it. I was posting a, a picture. I don't know if if you you realize this, but if you if you look at my posts on Facebook, I don't I don't just say something and then put a picture. I put the picture first and then I write the caption around it because I'm giving people an opportunity to get the message through words or pictures or both. Uh, I guess that's how I'm wired. I'm a writer, kind of. And I paint pictures with words or crazy behavior. So I had found this very, very beautiful picture that was taken a long time ago. And I posted it and I was, you know, in my usual understated way, <laughs> I was getting ready to, talk, to write a poetry in motion. <laughs> because, you know, humble thing, Viking. And I, instead of writing poetry, I wrote pivotry, and I looked at it, and I thought, oh, for heaven's sakes. And then I thought, oh, oh, for heaven's sakes. How cool is that? Pivotry in motion sounds like something. It sounds rather fabulous. And I thought, I've coined a phrase. I've coined a phrase. Well, I haven't. There's a, there's a, there's a, an entity I think of him as this little guy, he's about this big, and he lives in the back of my head and he looks stuff up and hands it out to me. <laughs> he's a genius. I'm just kind of standing here waiting for him to hand me stuff. Occasionally his uh, slightly slow brother subs in for him when he's, I don't know, on vacation and hands me out stuff and I open my mouth and, and I think, oh God, <laughs> when's the real guy coming back? Anyway, the guy hand me out divotry in motion. And I think pivotry is our superpower. Pivotry is what we have always known how to do. And we always do. We just, we just um, don't realize it. Because we do it automatically. It's, it's how we're wired. And, you know, to, to, ruin it for everyone <laughs> because oh darn to to ruin it for everyone 
what's really going on when we pivot, when we introduce pivotry to the moment, is um, it's a kind of profiling. Think of yourself as an FBI profiler. And what we do is we look at a situation that we are in. And we automatically bring the best version of us to deal with it. We do it spontaneously. And because we do it spontaneously, we don't, we're not aware of it. It's invisible. It's, it's, uh, we have three brains. This is my theory. We have three brains. We have a cave brain. Over here, a cave brain. Left and right. We have a cave brain that keeps us alive. A cave brain that has been with us since the, the days when our great, 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 greats lived in caves. This is a very primitive brain, but it does the really important stuff. It, uh, it remembers to tell us to breathe and uh, swallow. And, and when we're driving the car on long drives, it takes over. That's why when we get someplace, we think, I don't remember the last 10 miles. That was the cave brain. Cave brain said, you know what? Plan dinner. I'll look after this. So the cave brain is very primitive. The cave brain only knows one thing. It's the present tense. And it only knows that in the present tense, the most important thing is to please the alpha who runs everything in the cave so that we have value to the alpha and the alpha won't kick us out where all the saber tooth whatnots are. Uh, and by the way, hungry. So we will die. That's, that's cave brain. We then have actor brain who just stands around and waits for instructions and then does them. And then the most recent part of our brain that develops uh, right here in the front, it, I call stage manager brain, because stage manager brain can see cause and effect and it can see the big picture and it can say, no, 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 don't, no, oh, geez. <laughs> That's stage manager brain. So when we pivot, it is a combination of the three of our brains working together. And that very seldom happens. We pivot because within us, if, if, if we're older than the age of five, Freddie Moore just woke up, got back from vacation last night. Freddie, how is Chicago? <laughs> You're going to tell me all about it later. I can't wait. So when we pivot, this is what we're doing. The three brains get together and say, this requires that. And we pull out that part of us that takes care of that the best. And as I was saying before I noticed that Freddie had joined us, morning, Freddie. Um, if, if we have survived past the age of five, we have developed an almost unlimited number of personalities. We have developed qualities that we can pull out and present, good morning Josh, um, to the world when we need them. I, I like to think of it as, uh, you know when you see those, those perfect diamonds and they're kind of shaped like this and there's a round thing on top and, and when they turn in the light they, they sparkle, it's because of all the different facets that a jeweler has cut into them. So, you know, and as the diamond turns, we, we see all these different facets. I think of that image when I'm thinking of all our different personalities. Every one of them is there. We, we just don't have access to all of them until we pivot the diamond, that is us, to choose the right one. That, to me, pivoting and choosing based on how we profile what's going on, that's pivotry in motion. Do you love it? Here's what's amazing about it. Knowing we do it. Knowing how we do it. Means that not only can we do it again, we can do it on demand. We can own the fact that we do it. 
And that changes everything. And I'm going to tell you why. Life is complicated. <laughs> Life is complicated. And we get things thrown at us. Or we step into things all by ourselves and say, oh, well, that's really unfortunate. If, if you had more time than I really can take today, I could tell you the 11 million times I've done that, and you have too. When we know that we have an ability to bring our best selves to deal with something, it changes how we feel about ourselves. It changes how we feel about our strength. It changes how we feel about our confidence levels. When a whole lot of stuff happens that we didn't expect, that we've never seen before, it's confusing as hell. And uh, confusion is exhausting. Confusion is scary because it feels like we're outside the cave. We know what the cave looks like and feels like. It feels safe. Yeah. When we're in a place we've never seen before, when, when, when we're dealing with stuff that is never to our memory happened before. It's it's frightening. It's frightening and we feel stupid a lot of the time because we never did it before and therefore we're probably not good at it. And um, it, we, we, we don't know how to get better at it other than keep looking stupid until we figure it out. And that's exhausting, it's depressing, it's um, debilitating and it leaves us vulnerable to a lot of things. It leaves us vulnerable to the trolls out there. It leaves us vulnerable to the, the questions that we ask that are unhelpful. It leaves us vulnerable to giving up uh, and saying, it doesn't matter what the hell, who cares, I don't care. Um, and that reminds me of the Care Bears, of course, and the very first animated film we did, The Land Without Feelings, was about a little boy named Kevin who decided he didn't care. And uh, as I said in a previous video, <laughs> the, the, the plot of the, of the movie basically is that the Care Bears say, yeah, you do. <laughs> more gently, more gently. Every time I do, yeah, yeah you do, I'm, I'm, um, I'm channeling Viking Bear. <laughs> Come here. And when we have confidence, when we realize that we have power, that possibility is ours to own, we, we uh, you know, we stand a little taller, we throw our shoulders back, we kind of, we do the whole I'm walking here thing, and everything changes. And it's, it's in those moments, I'm sorry I keep looking down, but on this technology thing, something keeps popping up that says too low FPS, and I don't know what it means. And it doesn't matter, except that it's in the way, and then I can't, I can't see what I'm doing. That's why I keep compulsively reaching forward to try and fix it. You can't see it, so it just looks like I'm on a ship rocking back and forth. <laughs> so here's the thing about amazing. When we're feeling amazing, when we're feeling, you know what, that went better than I expected, alrighty then, throw the cat another goldfish. Um, we attract a lot of very cool people. Somehow, some way, on Facebook in the last couple of years, I have attracted you. And you have reminded me of all the possibilities that are out there. And in my conversations with you, in my can I still do this on camera thing, uh, can I reinvent how we uh, entertain, um, I've realized that I'm still me. I'm still the me I always was. It's just that every so often I was mom or a care bearer or a librarian. And now, thanks to you, I'm getting to talk about all of that. And thanks to you, I stumbled on the idea of pivotry and a book and an opportunity to interview you and share your stories of the ways you've pivoted to take ownership. 
of what's going on. It's because of us together. I, I was reading something very interesting this morning. I don't know if any of you followed Seth Godin. Seth Godin is an amazing uh, guy in terms of media and marketing and advertising. He's, um, he's a force to be reckoned with. And he was talking, I get a little newsletter from him every day. Every day he writes a newsletter. Every day, can you believe it? Um, he, today he was saying that uh, he thinks that this, this current generation... You know, we had the boomers, and before the boomers, we had the silent generation, and then we had uh, um, Gen X, and we had Gen Y, and, and Z, and millennials. He thinks the current one is going to be called Generation C because of connection, because of communication, because of computers, because of change, because of climate, because of COVID, because of construct how we construct, how we build, how we shape, how we pivot to find our way to the places we want to be. And I thought, I like Generation C. I have a better name, though. I have a better name. I think we are Generation What If. We are the generation that asks, What If? What If? I think that's I think that's what's going to happen. Some of us will still stay in the house in our pajamas. But most of us are going to stick our heads out the window, out the door of the cave. No saber-tooth whatnots? Hmm. What if? I think that's where we're going. And uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, add to the momentum with our books. And our wristbands. Oh my God. New people. New people I have stuff to share. I need to tell you this. I need to tell you this. I started with this and I'm going to do it again ad nauseum because it's just too amazing. So, Care Bears wristbands. Huh? Care Bears anniversary wristbands. You can't do that on television. Anniversary, mom's anniversary wristbands. Pivotry in motion. Abbey world, pivotry in motion. Wristbands, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, humans of all shapes and sizes. When we go live, when we're live, we're going to have wristbands. How awesome is that? Okay. So I have, I have this wonderful story to share about amazing people whose paths cross ours. Uh, I had a girlfriend in college who arguably is one of the smartest people I have ever met. And um, Jean, good morning, darling. You're here. You're here. I'm sorry I didn't notice. Oh my gosh, you've been you've been with us for four minutes and I've been looking in the wrong direction. Garen, frames per second. What is frames per second? Oh, FPS? Too low FPS. Not enough frames per second. Does that mean I'm in slow motion? <laughs> you see the problem? You see the problem? The guy in the back. I doubt that I'm in slow motion. Truly, I doubt it. Okay, back to... Oh, Karen always triggers these very strange <laughs> moments in my brain. So, back when I was in college, I met this amazingly beautiful woman who arguably is the smartest person I've ever met. We were in English class together at one point, and the professor asked a question, and she stood up holding the book and, and answered the question. And I, I looked at her. I, I have the same book. I looked at her, and I said, what page are you on? <laughs> I'm on the same page. What are you? Where? 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 <laughs> and she gave me a copy of a poem once. I'm not really a poet person, uh, although I suppose to a certain extent, Vikings were poets, so I guess there's part of that. 
And it was written by a woman I'd, I'd never heard of. Her name was Dorothy Parker, and it was a wonderfully funny, dry, biting, clever poem. So I went out and got the collected works of Dorothy Parker, and I was blown away, absolutely blown away. And I said to myself, you know what? If I wrote a play, if I wrote a one-woman show as this woman, as this incredibly brilliant woman, and I staged it, and I invited influential people to come and see it, the only thing I would have to do is not ruin it. Just don't mess up. That's all I had to do. So I, I wrote this play, and I found this very exclusive she-she club where no one had ever done a live show. And a friend of mine's parents were members, and they managed to get me permission to do my show there. And I invited all the, the entire production community. Uh, I, I wasn't really in show business yet. I was working for a man who was in show business, but I was the lowly gopher, you know? And um, I invited all the production community, everybody in radio and television. <laughs> I hadn't actually shown the, the script to anyone. <sighs> and it didn't occur to me that that might have been suicidal. It didn't occur to me, didn't occur to me, um, <laughs> career suicide, no. It didn't occur to me until about three seconds before I went on. And when it did occur to me, I thought, shit! And so I went on with a fair amount of energy. <laughs> Just don't scream, don't scream, don't scream. And I went out and I did the show. And this extraordinary thing happened. The very next morning at 10 o'clock, the phone rang. And it was one of the producers who'd been at the show. And she said, hi, Abby, my name is Thing. And um, I'm calling because I produce a show called Thing. And my host... Uh, has just informed me a, a couple of days ago that she won't be returning. And I saw you last night, and I'd like to know if you'd like to host your own television show. And I, I thought to myself, it can't possibly be this easy. I, I, I wasn't in show business. I don't know what I thought was going to happen when I staged the show. I, I, had, I hadn't really thought beyond stage the show and, and hope that all kinds of influential people would love the show. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't have any real plan after that. And yet, the plan had strolled across my path and said, how you doing? And I said, do, do, do you pay money? <laughs> the producer said, oh, well, of course. <laughs> I'll be right over. <laughs> Get the contract out. I left in the car and I drove over before she changed her mind and I, and I walked in. And she, she had seen me dressed as the character the night before. And I appeared to her to be, because show business being what it is, I appeared to be this tiny, quiet brunette. And then I walked in, looking like this, and she said, I swear to God, she said, what have you done? And I said, to whom? <laughs> and when? And in, in between the night before and me coming in to see her, she'd had their, their, their art director create a, a, a storyboard of the new show hosted by me and there's this fabulous picture that he's this graphic designer guy who's done this incredible layout all sparkly and magic and show business with this tiny <laughs> this tiny little brunette in the middle of the set and I said oh well I can look like that if you want I mean I no, 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 she said, I want the real you. And I thought, well, you're brave. And <laughs> the thing is, it, it happened. It happened. Out of nowhere, out of the clear blue of the western sky, a show. Ta-da! Mine. My show. Darlings. 
So while all of that was unfolding, and we had an amazing, <laughs> we had an amazing year, we did some amazing things. I completely screwed up, um, and I know you'll be surprised to hear that. I completely screwed up, not realizing that you need to have a permit in order to take a camera crew into a bar where people are drinking. <laughs> you need to have a right, like a, a, a release. So not only did I not know that, and not only did we not have that, but I followed uh, Chris Christofferson into the bar, where, where he met with his old pal, Ronnie Hawkins, who was performing in the bar. <laughs> and we had that on camera with no waivers or permits either. <laughs> so the, there, there were two upshots. One was that I was never allowed to do that again. However, we won an amazing award. I mean, this was golden, what what we pulled off. And I kept thinking, well, what's so wrong with this? Well, apparently permits and rules and, you know, who knew? And um, so very shortly after I won that amazing award, there was a strike. <laughs> and right after the strike, my show was canceled. And uh, I went from all of that to nothing at all. And then another friend whose path I had crossed, another brilliant, beautiful, wonderful, talented friend who was coaching a bunch of kids for a television series, called me up and said, so, you busy? And I said, oh, shut up. And she said, no, no, seriously, I have an idea. You need to audition for this show. And I said, doesn't it have children in it? And she said, you know what? It's being made in Ottawa. Who's going to see it? I said, well, there's a point. And she said, it pays good money. All right, then. <laughs> I'll be right over. And I signed up. And then, you know, you can't do it on television. And mom. And the rest is history. Back, though, to the Dorothy Parker saga, I... <laughs> Steve, Chris, and Ronnie, wow. Yeah, it was awesome. Remember Barrymore's? It was there, Steve. <laughs> Much to everyone's surprise. <laughs> um, I, I continued to do the one-woman show about Dorothy Parker. And one day... I got a call from a friend who was in the music production end of show business who said, listen, I, I have a wonderful opportunity to um, book a band at this very shishi elegant private members club. And um, I've realized that I can do more than just have the band. I think you should come and you should perform Dorothy Parker. I think it's exactly the right audience for you. And I said, oh, well, what a lovely idea, let's do that. So, uh, this club, at one time, was the, the private behind the scenes, uh, you know how you, you have the, the power brokers in politics and, and in government and in um, industry, um, and, and there are backroom deals that get made and so on. This club was that in its heyday. It was the place where all the big power decision makers went to dinner, had drinks, and changed the world. So not so much in its present incarnation, but it did have that, that legacy and that history. So all of a sudden, I'm being given the opportunity to present as the wittiest woman in America in this club where all the best people rub shoulders. And I thought, it's perfect. It's the perfect audience. So I went there and I, and I did the show. And everyone was um, lovely. And they enjoyed the material because they were smart and witty and educated and really liked great wit. And Dorothy Parker was a world-changing wit. And um, at one point, 
I was talking, so Dorothy Parker was alive and well in the time of Ernest Hemingway. She lived in New York, she was a, a writer for Vanity Fair and Vogue magazine, and she, she said the most inappropriate things, and people laughed and laughed and laughed, and then she was in all the society columns the next day. And uh, she and her cohorts just got into all kinds of trouble because they were the society darlings of the day. So at one point she got an opportunity to go to Hollywood. This was basically in the Depression. And it was bizarre for them, a lot of the people left New York and went to Hollywood, because while everybody else was starving, they were making you know, thousands of dollars a week. And as she said, writing Drek for the people. And at one point in the story, so what I did in order to do this play is I cobbled together from her biography and her published work. And I reached out to the, the people who own the rights to all of her stuff. And I sent them the script and I said, may I do this? And they sent back a letter that said, yes, you may. And we love the script. And I said, well, thank you very much. So at one point in the play, I was, as Dorothy Parker, saying, when we were in Hollywood, we would give large extravagant parties. And I would stand at the front door of our opulent mansion. And I would greet my guests with my familiar gesture of greeting. Darlings, so good of you to come. Do you want to meet the rest of the shits inside? So normally that got kind of a polite laugh. <laughs> the, rest, the rest of the shits inside. There was a woman seated directly in front of me at a table. Beautiful, elegant, slender, gray hair tinted as sort of a mauve. Just a stunning woman. All the jewels were real. When I said familiar gesture of welcome. Do you want to meet the rest of the shits inside? That elegant woman laughed so hard, she finally had to pick up her napkin and put it in front of her face because she lost all control of her muscles, of her facial muscles. And she howled with laughter. So I stopped. One never treads on good laughter. I stopped and I stood there with my hand still up as she laughed. And the, the rest of the room, after a while, they, they were all kind of smiling at, at, at this spectacle. And I just stood there. And when she finally crested and came down and I said, Lady, and she looked up at me, she was pulling the napkin down, I said, you get a free pass to any show I ever do for the rest of your natural life. And I lost her again. She just went up and over and howled, and then the entire room howled. And um, when it was all over, I, and I finished the show, I went over to the table and I said, I apologize for making fun of you and singling you out. And she said, darling, in my entire life, no one has ever profiled me as accurately as you did. You're going places. Now, <laughs> I've never obviously forgotten that. I've never forgotten that someone of style and grace and stature and success and a trajectory of a life well lived told me that I had it. Whatever it is I needed to have, I had it. And this is why I'm telling you this story. We don't just pivot because we can. There are times when we need a boost 
we can get stuck. We can get caught up in something uh, <laughs> unhelpful. We can make a pitfall pivot and find ourselves lying down with dogs and waking up with fleas. We can pivot our way into a bad mood, into a poor me, into um, a cycle of repeating a mistake as though we're stuck in, a, in, a, in a, that groove. Here's where the true magic is. Not only do we have all of the tools, all of the personas, the personalities, the, the diamond facets within us to pivot to our best self. We have the amazing people whose paths cross ours have the power to trigger our what if. They can somehow nudge awake our sparkle. They can shift us out of glum and into gosh. They don't necessarily do it deliberately on purpose. We are in their orbit, and they are in ours, and we collide. And, ta-da, every time I have an issue, I have something, I've chosen badly, my foot hurts, whatever, the pants shrunk when I wasn't looking, I um I tell myself a thing my dad used to say. He said, "You know what? Sooner or later, whether we try or not, we all become butterflies." And Sometimes when I was having a bad day, he would give me a hug and he would say, never mind, little one, you'll soon be a butterfly. That's what these pivot people do to us. They nudge us out of complacency. They nudge us out of the discomfort zone. A discomfort zone, by the way, is a comfort zone that got too small. We put up with it. We said it's not that bad until it was too small. And now it really isn't okay. Now it really isn't comfortable. It's uncomfortable. And we can't, we can't fit. And these pivotry people, these pivot magic people come along and bump us. We know where they are. They live in our heads alongside all of our amazing facets. That night in that show, when I said, you want to meet the rest of the shits inside, and that woman dissolved in front of me, I forgot everything. I forgot where I was. I forgot who I was. I forgot the next line in the show, in that moment. I was mesmerized by the pivot nudge I had given her, thanks to Dorothy Parker and to my beautiful, talented, clever friend who said, you need to read this poem. That's the ripple effect. That's how we are connected. That's how our orbits cross and collide. That's how we are, this incredible tribe. And the difference between us, you and I, 
and everyone else is that they just don't know it yet. We do. And we are going to show them how amazing it is with us here on the inside. Is that incredible? I told you I had an awesome aha. I just, I just couldn't wait to share it. I couldn't wait to share the fact that the wristbands came on time. Because there's nothing like planning a live event and then wondering if you're stuff. <laughs> it's going to be there. And it is. How amazing is that? Okay. So today is Shoes Day. I will be back on Thursday. I have more stuff to share. I have one more interview. And then I have all the stories that I am now piecing together and drafting into their, their rough form. And um, then I'm going to have to get back with all of my incredible collaborator, collaborators, I can't even say it, and communicators, and polish the details so that their chapters look fine. And um, I'm excited. Can you tell? Okay. Between now and Thursday, you know the drill. You need to be good to you. We need to get you out of the glums and shift it into gosh. Embracing for the incredible colliding with amazing people who are already in your orbit. You just don't know it yet. So be good to you and hug your loved ones. They don't know they're on the ride with you. Oh my. Talk to you next time.